coming up on this week's A Lively Experiment. Providence joins half a dozen other municipalities and school districts across the country in suing the major social media companies. And the Senate president would like to see online casino gambling come to Rhode Island. A Lively Experiment is generously underwritten by... Hi, I'm John Hazen White Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program in Rhode Island PBS. Joining us for the analysis, Billy Hunt, Chairman of the Libertarian Party of Rhode Island. Steve Frias, National Committee Man for the Rhode Island Republican Party. And former Rhode Island Democratic Party Chairman, Bill Lynch. Hello and welcome to this week's A Lively Experiment. I'm Jim Hummel. The city of Providence has filed a lawsuit against the parent companies of the major social media companies saying they are contributing to the deteriorating mental health of young people. In its federal suit, the city is seeking an unspecified amount of money and stronger regulations for the companies. Steve, let me begin with you today. As I was thinking about this on the way in, I wonder, is this the 2023 version of the tobacco and then the lead paint, and now we're suing the social media companies? Um, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of the lawsuit, to be honest with you. It looks like somewhat of, you know, municipalities looking for someone, someone to blame for the problems that are occurring in society and then trying to figure out some deep pockets to get money for themselves on this. Um, I don't want to, I, 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 let me tell, be straight, I don't care for social media. I hate the fact I got teenagers and they want to spend so much time on social media. But really, if you want to address it, the best way to address it is parents getting involved in their children's lives and putting some controls and making sure that they don't, you know, get into trouble spending so much time on social media, but go into court suing people. I mean, it reminds me of the Ozzy Osbourne suit in 19, like in the 1980s when somebody was suing Ozzy Osbourne, the rock musician, blaming him for the suicide of their teenage son. It's, I, I think of this as just some sort of money grab attempt. And so I'm, and it, I think it infringes on free speech significantly. So I'm pretty skeptical of the lawsuit. Bill? Well, I, I think you're right. I think it's a cookie, cut, cookie cutter approach, just like it was with the, uh, originally with tobacco, which obviously was successful. But, you know, if you, turn the national trial lawyers group loose, they can find pe people with deep pockets and sue them. I think that's what's going on here. I don't blame the city of Providence. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the new mayor is looking at the, pro the issue and the problems that it causes, which are realistic. I don't know that that's the answer. It'll be curious to see. I'm, I've been actually more interested in following the legislation that's presently um, being proposed in Washington right now because it's one of the few areas if not the only area where there's actually some bipartisan support on both sides of the aisle to try to figure out if there's a way uh, that makes sense to legislate and try to control some of the issues that the social media is causing. But and what would that suit do? Well, it's, it's, they're, they're trying to figure out ways to require maybe age limits before you can access so, you know, the social media. Um, whether or not these companies are really, I, I think most people think these companies have not been as transparent as they should have been with respect to how they're using these algorithms and what they're doing with information uh, that younger people are using on social media. So some of the bills, I think, for the first time, and, and frankly, um, Congressman Land, uh, Congressman Land, Congressman Cicilline deserves a little bit of credit for this as he as he leaves because he was one of the leaders down in D.C. in trying to get people to focus on the issues and the problems it's causing. So I think there's going to be some legislation that will address it. I, I don't know. I mean, Providence schools have been failing <laughs> since the cordless phone, let alone the smartphone <laughs> in social media. So I don't know why all of a sudden this seems to be an issue. I mean, when I was a kid, it was video games, uh, movies with sex and violence was before that, uh, back before the turn of the century. The good old days when you actually had to go to the theater. Yeah, right? I know. I mean, well, they were worried about dime novels, comic books, teddy bears, you know, everything back in the day was a, a tragedy that was going to affect the, the youth and everything like that. So I think this boils down to an out-of-touch uh, generation that doesn't understand uh, technology, doesn't doesn't understand how to put the uh, safeguards in place for the children to use this stuff. There's all sorts of parental controls that you can use, uh, but it takes effort. You got to be involved with your children. Uh, you got to be able to know what they're doing, uh, who their social uh, things are. This is why it's important for people to raise their children and not the government to raise their children, uh, is because you should be having uh, those interactions with them and not be relying on the government to do it. Um, you know, the idea that this is going to be uh, a one-time funding that's going to create a department that 
that's going to need to be funded and staffed and uh, in perpetuation. And we know with uh, departments and uh, things in government in the state of Rhode Island, they don't go away ever. So, you know, social media will evolve and won't be a thing anymore. And we'll still have a social de media department in 50 years if, uh, you know, they have their way in the city of Providence right now. I think now. one of the problems with the, with the um, litigation is that the tobacco litigation didn't stop people from smoking. Right, but but it did raise awareness and, it, and well, probably stopped problem, some people. Really, they took the money and plugged the budget hole. Right, <laughs> they so didn't really yeah. use it for what it was. Right, so that's my point. I mean, I'm right. not sure that this litigation is really going to address the issues. I think that, as hesitant as I am to say it, I think it's going to be better addressed, hopefully, by legislation because there seems to be some support in the Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party in Washington to do something about this. Don't you think the regulations <coughs> are more important than the money? I mean, money's always nice, but these it's almost like the Fox settlement. You know, $800 million and they move on. These money, these, they're, they're awash in money, but it's the control. Well, eight hundred million is not a lot to you and Steve. But oh, no. Yeah. But, <laughs> no, the problem is when you talk about the money issue, you always know that, like as you said, with the tobacco money back in Governor Almond's time, you know they just did it the plug budget hole, so it doesn't really go to help people in the particular scenario that's uh, needed here. Regulation could be a solution, but again, I think the solution that's best is parents being involved in their kids' lives. I'm I'm the best form of regulation. Okay, I put parental controls on my kids' stuff, make sure they don't have it for uh, you know unlimited amount of hours, and I try to restrict what they can see. That's the best form of regulation, parent and child. It's Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act, which gives social it's media platforms, exempt them from the liability from what's going on in their platform. So social media companies love regulations. They want, large corporations want regulations because that prevents upstart competition and people uh, from being able to come and provide alternatives that have better controls, better product, aren't manipulating their users. Uh, and if we do start regulating these companies more and start giving them, it's going to create a barrier to entry and do uh, what is known as Gooding's Law, which will prevent uh, any new in innovations or anything like that to happen uh, for these social media companies. So it will be stagnated with what the regulations say, and then all the mass information will be uh, limited to what the government parameters are only. But isn't that what you were talking about in terms of legislation? Because Section 230 has always been a big issue. That's been a big issue in Congress. But in order to get at the regulation, you'd have to really get at 230 to remove that exemption to be that's able why, to That's why them, I right? think the issue is going to be better addressed federally because those are the issues. And, and listen, it's like anything else. At the time that that legislation was passed, there wasn't the existence of social media as it exists today. Mm. So unfortunately what happens a lot of times in, in, with uh, our government is that it's constantly catch up and industries like the social media companies are able to stay a step ahead of them. But I think that, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious and I'm, I'm sort of intrigued that I think there may be some legislation to address at least some of the big issues. It's not going to solve the entire problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, Steve's correct. The, the best answer, obviously, is, is parents that are active, involved, parental controls, things that do exist. But in a, that's in a perfect world. Unfortunately, this is not a perfect world. Yeah, I, I'm always amused by, you know, they say you have to be 13 to sign up. And you got, on Facebook, right? You got, <laughs> and, and all these other, you've got kids who are like seven, eight, nine, whatever. Mm -hmm. They figured it out. So it, it's a full-time job, not only being a parent, but trying to police it, right? Oh, it sure is. I mean, my wife, there's two parents, and I think it takes two parents to be one, <laughs> sometimes handling this social media stuff, but in the end, everything comes back to the home and your home life, and having the government substitute for parents in the long run is not a really good solution. It's not really viable. So you got to have parental involvement, and the government's not really a good substitute for it. All right, we're getting to the end of the session, and uh, Senate President Dominic Ruggiero is unveiling legislation now. We're getting toward the 11th hour. He talked earlier in the session about online gaming, basically having your casino right on your phone. Probably something that three or four years ago we weren't thinking about. Bill, well, I don't know. Look, they're looking at revenue down the line. We've been awash in money for so long, and that COVID money is going to be running out. So when you look at the figures, it's a lot of money. I'm just not sure. We'll get to the legality, and Joe Larissa has some issues and all of that, Attorney Joe Larissa. But online gaming, is this just an extension of what we've been doing? Look, we've been talking about this for years <clears throat> on this program. Going and back I, to casinos, yeah, right, originally. I, that's right, and I've, and I've said it. Uh, before that that this was the creeping effect of gambling that was going to happen and it's going to happen I mean there's no doubt in my mind that it's going to happen and we get caught up in sort of this competitive environment where Mass what's Massachusetts doing what's Connecticut doing what's New York doing and frankly when you talk about big businesses nobody's got more money to sort of get their message out there than these casinos and these gambling companies but 
people are going to gamble and, and, and it's going to be on your phone and you're going to be able to do it. The question is how, you know, is it going to be controlled? How are you going to control it? It's going to be raise a whole host of, of significant issues, I think, and, and I'm not sure we're ready for it, frankly. Billy? Uh, Panem et circense, uh, give them bread and circuses and they will never revolt, right? So as long as the, the people have uh, entertainment, uh, they're not going to be looking at the systemic issues in uh, our state. And, uh, you know, uh, if you want to know how libertarians regard the state, uh, just compare them to a criminal band and all of the, uh, you know, the logically will fall into place. So the difference between a criminal band and the state, obviously, being is that the criminal band doesn't lose money on a sports book. They actually make money. Uh, and the government in the state of Rhode Island seems to find every single way possible to, uh, you know, screw up online gaming and make it uh, something that's more of a social ill in our state and not provide any of the benefits. This is all supposed to go back towards funding education uh, and everything like that. Uh, that seems kind of quaint. Well, years ago, that was going to be a funding stream. Well, right, the conspiracy theory with that is too is they're also not s teaching statistics in uh, K through 12, which uh, goes to show that uh, anybody that understands statistics would know that they wouldn't play the lottery. Uh, so maybe that has something to do with that, why that's not included mm -hmm. in the curriculum. But you know, this is just something that uh, it, gambling should be done yeah, just like any type of free market activity. The government should not be involved. It should not be regulating. They're not bringing anything to the table. Uh, they're just basically detracting from uh, the state. Mr. Fries? Um, gambling, we'll talk about marijuana, <laughs> smoking, all these things are basically vices of some kind or another. They promote addictive behavior. And the reason that you know, we don't prohibit it because it's just too, it's impossible to prohibit it. It's not effective. But we then allow it to exist so that we put regulations on it and then we do tax it so that we, societies, the cost that those activities ca cause on society, we at least get money to address them, like healthcare costs sometimes. And gambling addictions are bad. Um, online gambling in particular, yes, I agree with uh, Mr. Lynch. It's a next step, people are doing it. It's, think about this though, 24 seven people have access constantly to gambling. People with addictions, it's gonna ruin their lives. Mm. And so we do need some money to address those problems. And I don't think we actually do enough. We, we benefit, the government gets money from gambling sources, but they never dedicate a portion of it to deal with sometimes the, the fallout that it comes from it. And that's, that's what I think is really sad about it, is that we don't do enough to address the problems that people are the victims of their own addictions in this thing. Yeah, I'm not sure I disagree with that. I, I think that, 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 frankly, any addiction, we don't do a good job, uh, certainly not a great job, dealing with any addiction. You know, right now there's a mental health crisis in Rhode Island. I'm in court, you know, three or four days a week, and you can't find a mental health professional or psychiatrist or psychologist that's available to take even young children, kids that are having problems. So we've got all kinds of addictions, and we don't do a good job, I don't think, addressing them or prioritizing them. Um, and, and gambling addiction, I think, is, is a significant problem, um, but we've got to figure out a better way to deal with it because gambling is not going away. Mm -hmm. There's going to be gambling. It's, you're going to be able to do it on your phone. It's going to create additional uh, addiction problems. I've represented people who have lost their businesses, their lives, their families because of an addiction, including gambling, substance abuse, uh, so, yeah, I think it's a serious problem and one that, that we need to prioritize more as a government. And Massachusetts is eating our lunch now with sports betting. So this is, I mean, this is the, but sports betting's here, and that was always the concern. And it's going to be a big deal a year or two from now when we're scraping for every single penny because we have a $14 billion budget. Yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, to, to Bill's point, too, though, uh, in, in uh, the idea of, uh, the addiction and the social ills and everything like that, uh, those are symptoms of a larger cause. The root cause is more of the systemic issues in our, our country and our state uh, that are providing social media addiction, uh, you know, online gambling, uh, substance abuse addiction. And, you know, really this is a reflection of our, our community and our culture as a whole, and we really need to start focusing more on that, I think, than the symptoms. I know if the, I know if the Senate president wants something, it usually goes through, but he also has the governor and the House speaker, and here we are, it's the first week of May. So I wonder if this is kind of a trial balloon or whether you think this has any chance of going through this this session. Uh, it, it may not go, if it doesn't go through this session, it'll probably go through the next one. I mean, the, the bottom line is, is that once the COVID cash, the Biden bucks go away, people are all going to be scrambling looking for money. And they always want to go after what I call the sin taxes. People with addictions, people who have these use, uh, these, engage in these activities and say, let's go after them. It's easy. 
And so if it doesn't happen this session, probably be the next. Personally, I agree with, you know, Mr. Larissa that this should actually be up to the voters. That's why I think it's the best way to read the Constitution. Yeah, that's the last thing we didn't mention. Joe Larissa has been a big issue on uh, making sure that voter approval, that ship seems to have sailed because... Yeah. He says, it, uh, the Constitution says, in order for it to be an expansion, it has to have voter approval. We've missed a couple of steps along the way, particularly with sports betting. I, I think so. I think he's correct. But I think the ship has sailed in the sense that the <coughs> states decided we need the money. And the people generally now, I think, in the state, a majority of them probably support these sorts of activities because it's going to be there anyways. what Mr. Lynch said. It's going to be in the, there anyway. So let's get some revenue from it. But I think procedurally it should be done by vote approval. All right, let's move to uh, from one vice to another. Legalized marijuana was going to be the, I see Billy uh, laughing here. Legalized marijuana uh, was going to be the big thing. A year ago, they created or said they were going to create a cannabis commission. Turns out the governor still has not appointed all the people necessary for that. Uh, the sales are lagging. They've got too much inventory. And maybe because we're taxing it a lot, right, Bill? Well, yeah, I mean, th this is the whole thing. You know, Massachusetts got the leg up on us just like with sports betting and they've gotten and established uh, stores in locations proximity to Rhode Island. Uh, you know how it is in retail and people get in routines. They go to the stores that they like and it's hard to break that habit and have them go to a different location. Uh, you also got to think that Rhode Island's a state of a million people. You know, on, we're talking about maybe one in five people that use cannabis in the country. You're talking about not a large pool of people to sell this to, not to mention the number of those users who are uh, still buying it on the black or the gray market. Uh, so, you know, you start thinking about the revenue revenue projection that they had, which was about a million dollars a month that they were looking to get. Uh, and they're falling well below those those figures. And I don't see it uh, getting any better. The more of uh, these dispensaries and the uh, the places that open up, you're just going to get more supply and it's going to uh, decrease demand and decrease prices. And I mean, it's good for uh, the consumer, I guess. Uh, but to your point, the higher taxes and everything like that uh, makes it more attractive to still go purchase the stuff on the gray market. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I think it's like any new business. We talked about this a little bit in the past where, you know, there was so much uh, time and effort put into concerns about how the marijuana market was going to expand because everybody sort of recognized, I think, that it was going to expand. And it's clearly driven by what other states, again, which is constant for Rhode Island, what other states around us are doing. Yeah, and we don't live in Montana. You no. Can, I live a mile from Seacock. No, and I, and I think in, in the marijuana business in particular, and I, I, you know, met with a number of people who were interested in that whole process, and I think what happened was that a lot of people thought you could get in early at, a, at an inexpensive amount of money and that everybody was going to become multimillionaires mm -hmm. when it expanded. And, and so you had all of these growers, a lot of them were small, underfunded, uh, who haven't been able to, to keep up uh, because they're producing and there's not enough places at the time to sell it. So there became a real financial struggle with some of these people. And I think the other thing that we're seeing, which I think was predictable and people thought, well, maybe we can find a way to avoid it, is that bigger companies are sort of now starting to move into other states having done this early on and become a bigger factor, including in Rhode Island. And, and you're familiar with North Carolina and that whole area where tobacco farms are now being converted soybeans. into <laughs> soybeans and marijuana farms yep. um, because of the decreased uh, mm -hmm. demands for tobacco. And so it's changing the whole environment. I think that a lot of the people early on who had a lot of these preliminary licenses in Rhode Island haven't been able to to stay solvent because of that. Yeah, but the other issue is they haven't been able to issue the license because the governor hasn't appointed the Cannabis Commission. He's had a year. Mm -hmm. And then there's the classic Rhode Island thing. Massachusetts and Connecticut can advertise. You see the big billboards as you're going into Massachusetts, and we can't do that. So it's almost like trying to run a business with two arms tied behind your back. Yeah, I mean, let's start out with the first point, which you made the governor hasn't made these appointments. One of the problems with the law was that it was written where the Senate president and the House Speaker get to submit a list and say, you got to pick one of these people. But they've done that already. I know, but that's a separ separation of powers issue probably is going on here, which is the governor says, why do I have to pick people that the House and the So Senate you do want? nothing? So, no, what I'm saying is, like, what, that's number one, is that what you should have gone is gone to court and challenge it. That's what I would say. That should have been done. Uh, and then if you can't succeed uh, legally, then you got to follow the law and just appoint the people that on the list. The second thing on the advertising thing, to be honest with you, Jim, um, I got kids who are teenagers, and I have no interest in promoting marijuana. So the fact that they can't put advertising up 
I'm fine with. Actually, I should, they shouldn't have even any billboard advertising. I mean, I don't want to see Joe Camel, Mr. Marlboro. I don't see the Pop Man. I don't really care. They might be getting it on their Instagram feed. <laughs> well, I, I, whatever. I mean, I get what you're saying. But there's only I'm, so many things you can do, Steve. See, I know that, but see, see, this is what it is. It's my it, for me. <laughs> Steve's it's still a, going on those rotary dial phones. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not into Vice. So this is a vice. So promoting it with trying to make a great big industry, it's like, no, look, people want to do it. That's fine. They're going to do it. But I don't want to, uh, turning Rhode Island into a giant pot industry and having all these billboards and advertising over it, I, I'm not a big fan of that. Oh, we have, I mean, to the, your point, we're making this a bigger industry than it needs to be. This, we should be regulating cannabis plants like we regulate tomato plants. Anybody should be able to do whatever they want with them, grow whatever they want with them, use it however they want to use it. Uh, the fact that we're going ahead and trying to put all these uh, barriers around it and build this whole infrastructure surrounding it is just showing that uh, you're creating a limited number of licenses. And whenever you do that, you're creating winners and losers. The government is choosing uh, who's going to have those licenses, who's going to be successful, who's going to make money off this. And to Bill's point, you end up with out-of-state companies, large corporations who have the uh, money, the backing, the skills, and everything. And know the to, long game. Yeah, exactly. And know how to go ahead and manipulate and navigate the complicated, unnecessarily complicated process. The amount of revenue that would be generated if we just had uh, HVAC uh, people, electricians, uh, you know, carpenters building out spaces, uh, servicing the industry in general would generate enough tax revenue that we would need to support the industry and support the, you know, the safeguards and uh, that would need to be put in place for it. All right, so we're on record, no vice in the Fryas house. <laughs> that's right. Try to keep it out which, as much as you can. I'm just happy my You have three kids, did. right? I have three kids and my father was no drugs, no drugs, and I'm doing <laughs> the same thing with my kids. And I'm not about to go on TV and say, we need more pot in Rhode Island for our revenues. Bring on the billboards. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go to uh, outrages or kudos. Mr. Lynch, what do you have this week? I, uh, my outrage, I think, has to be Clarence Thomas, and not just Clarence Thomas, but the U.S. Supreme Court. I, I think that, you know, as a lawyer, and I'm not going to speak for Steve, but, you know, there's always been, I think, people kind of looked up to the Supreme Court, even if you didn't really know. If you weren't a lawyer, you didn't know exactly what they did. They sort of had a different perspective, I think, and that's gone. I think that's been shattered. Um, polls, national polls show that the confidence in the Supreme Court is being other than anything other than another political entity are pretty much gone at this point. And now we've got instances where Clarence Thomas, among maybe among others, has ta taken looks like millions of dollars at this point from a wealthy, happen to be Republican um, businessman in his particular instance, and not disclosed it. And and going on, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of trips, has members of his family's tuition being paid by these these political um, donors. Uh, if if even in Rhode Island, if you had a judge that was found to be doing what Clarence Thomas is doing, they'd be off the bench. That is no doubt in my mind that they would not be permitted to remain uh, as a sitting judge. And the Supreme Court, so far, um, has just sort of turned its nose up at everybody and said we're going to. We're going to do whatever we want to do. We'll decide what's right or wrong. And I think they're tone deaf to what people in this country think. And I want to give a quick kudo to Senator Whitehouse because for years, um, Senator Whitehouse has been complaining and trying to put a spotlight on this issue and people have just sort of poo-pooed him and, and put him off. And I think, unfortunately, for the rest of us, it's turning out to be completely true that the Supreme Court has become just, frankly, just another political body and has lost the respect of the majority of people in this country. Before we get to yours, let me just get a quick response, because the national Republicans have said, oh, this is because the Democrats, the, you know, they're upset because they don't have control. Mm -hmm. To me, it started, and we, there was just a revelation overnight, there was a nonprofit set up to funnel money to uh, Justice Thomas's wife, and they specifically said, make sure that her name's not on it. To me, it's getting into a dangerous area, my thought, it goes beyond politics, it's basic ethics. So I wonder as you look at that, what do you make of all that's going on with the criticism of the Supreme Court? Because then Alito says, well, you know, we're taking it, we're being hammered every day. Is that criticism justified? I think it's only partially justified. And let me just try, try to be quick. The response is a lot of this is about the frustration that liberals have that the court is no longer is, is conservative. And therefore, this is part of their agenda to try to do court packing. Yeah. Now, in regards to the merits of this point, um, I think there should be more disclosure, and there should be disclosure requirements. And um, I think that was some some of these things that Justice Thomas has done. Is I call technical violations, but I don't know if they're intentional. The problem that's occurring is too is that you have judges like Sotomayor, who's not recusing herself 
when like Random House comes before her and she has a book deal with Random House. Like in our state, you would probably, that would be a conflict of interest, that would be a business associate kind of relationship. So what I think has to happen is that the judges at the Supreme Court, sure, let's have more disclosure laws. B, I think the judges should be recusing themselves when a interested person is before them that is giving them gifts. Isn't that or, ethics 101? I mean, yes, but I mean, like the, the Clarence Thomas thing is more about disclosure versus like there's not people appearing before him. Like this guy, Mr. Crow, who they're talking about, he's not appearing before him. It's not him. an Abe Fortas-like he's, thing. Where Abe Fortas had... was on the take. Yeah. I mean, literally, he was taking $120,000 from a guy who was under investigation for securities fraud. And resigned. And eventually had to resign well, and was going to be potentially investigated for tax evasion. So that was my last point. When somebody does something criminal in our system that's a judge, there's two avenues, impeachment removal for high crimes and misdemeanors, or second, Department of Justice brings a criminal action against you. None of the stuff that I'm seeing with Clarence Thomas is criminal. It's stupid, bad looks and that he should disclose this. Um, it should have, he should have done it. And the fact that it's coming out now, I think, has a lot to do with the timing of the Dobbs decision and the, the liberals' desire for court right, We'll get back to that in just a second. Let me get outrage or kudo, and then we'll go back. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> outrage, real quick. Uh, it's more of a critique. Um, at the State House, people like to promote housing legislation. But some of this housing legislation does more than just housing. It does commercial development and overrides local control. So my suggestion to the politicians up at the State House is stop pushing legislation that overrides our zoning and local control and focus on housing. And the best way to focus on housing is to give cities and towns financial incentives to have more housing, because more housing costs money to local taxpayers. That's my critique to the people up at the State House. Right, we'll put a new outrage kudo <laughs> critique. <laughs> oh, I just, uh, fi well, I guess kudos because finally we're out of the state of emergency. I mean, that's uh, that's a big thing right there. And um, coming just, up next week, well, right? I think you've uh, had that circle uh, on your calendar for three years. Well, you know, I I'll sit here and say that uh, all the spending and millions, trillions of dollars that we printed and put into the economy, it's it's kind of disheartening when you hear reports from the Department of Labor and Training saying that all that uh, money that we put out, that it's got sent out in fraud and everything like that, and overpayments is probably not going to be able to be recruit by the state of Rhode Island. Uh, meanwhile, we're spending money on penguins and God knows what else uh, and not really spending money on, uh, you know, again, this is something that's killed the economy. Uh, inflation's out of control. Banks are failing and all for what? I mean, it's really just, uh, uh, just shows how terrible the whole response to COVID was. We have about a minute left. Your response on the whole deal with the Supreme Court. You want to I don't say think something? it's the end of the Thomas situation. So I think that when you talk about whether or not there may be uh, every, activity every day that's it's problematic. Drip, drip, right? and, the, and the Fortis comparison, the tax evasion, is a whole other question. It was whether or not, in my mind, Clarence Thomas has disclosed any of these funds that he was directly benefiting from, because he clearly was. You got somebody paying for tuition that you would have had to pay for. You're going on trips and everything else. So I don't think this issue is done. I think, frankly, it's just the beginning. In the but the bottom line is he this. can't be removed. It's it's public pressure, and at this point, there's no way he's going to voluntarily resign. That tips the balance of the court. I don't think I, I'll just say I don't think this is the end of it. I, okay. I think there's more to come, and I'll be curious to see you know as public pressure builds where where that goes. And again, I, I don't think that the Congress is going to settle everything. But there's legislation now about forcing the Supreme Court to do more, at least in the terms of disclosure and ethical mm -hmm. responsibility. All right, folks, it's a quick 30 minutes. Thank you for joining us, Steve and Bill and Billy. Great to see you. Uh, come back here next week, folks. We will be all over what happens at the State House. Mix in a little bit of local and national. We'll be here with the analysis. Come back next week as a lively experiment continues. A lively experiment is generously underwritten by. Hi, I'm John Hazen White, Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program and Rhode Island PBS.